Hi everyone and welcome to episode three of RMIT's Technology Matters series. Today we'll be exploring what's next in the future of design. I'm Dean Chichi, I'm the Executive Director of Students here at RMIT University. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the people of the Wurrung and Bururong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations, on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. And while we conduct our work remotely in these times, I want to pay my respects to the wider unceded lands of the nation. Design has never been more important. It's responsible for shaping the built environment, the digital world and the products and services we use every day. Design creates better places, better products and better processes. And companies are fast realising that good design is a competitive advantage. At a time of bewildering technological advancement, visual saturation and increasingly complex systems, what role can design play in shaping our future? To better understand what's next in the world of design, we've assembled an expert group of RMIT researchers, academics and industry professionals working at the intersection of design and tech. So let's meet our panel. First up, we have Dr. Kate Sala. Kate is a sustainability advocate, business consultant, fashion educator and researcher. Kate has worked with leading fashion houses and creative agencies across Europe, including uh, Some Things Agency, Bless and H&M Group in Paris, as well as Honest Buy, the world's first fashion label built on total transparency, uh, which is based in Antwerp. Kate is an associate lecturer in the School of Fashion and Textiles here at RMIT, and her research explores the relationship between education and ethical fashion practices. Next up, we have Noel Wait. Noel, uh, Noel is a program manager of the Master of Communication Design at RMIT. Throughout his career, Noel has worked as an, exi uh, as an exhibition designer and curator and is a passionate believer in the human-centered design process. Uh, in 2014, Noel was a member of the steering committee, which successfully achieved UNESCO Creative City status for Dunedin in New Zealand. Finally, we have Michael Stoddard, the director of digital media enterprise at Adobe. Uh, having worked with Adobe for over 20 years, uh, Michael is well versed in new digital media technologies and has been integral in helping Adobe to better understand the needs of its customers uh, in the Asia Pacific. Michael has a wealth of experience in business development, marketing, management and sales. Great to have you with us today, Michael. OK, so today you have the opportunity to submit your questions to our speakers by entering them into the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, feel free to send these through at any time during the event and we'll try our best to uh, answer them at the end of this session. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be sent out via email uh, with the slides after the event. And don't forget to use our hashtag RMIT Tech Matters uh, if you're watching today. OK, so let's get into some discussion. So Adobe recently released Project Aero. Uh, it's a new tool for creating augmented reality experiences. AR is an incredibly immersive de uh, design medium that enables creatives to make content that blurs the lines between physical and digital worlds. Michael, how do artists and designers use AR during Adobe's recent Festival of the Impossible? Dean, thanks for the question and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, yes, Adobe's Festival of the Impossible is our uh, event that showcases what creatives can do with our new tool, Adobe Aero. Adobe Aero is a tool that allows designers to uh, get into augmented reality experiences in an easy and approachable way. And Festival of the Impossible, which uh, this year is on in July, on July the 13th, uh, is our online this year, online experience uh, to see what some of our artists uh, can do in the augmented reality space. Um, one of them, to answer your question, uh, Lucy McRae, uh, she is a body uh, architect uh, she is very much involved with exploring where the boundaries of the bodies stops and the rest of the world starts. Lucy, um, she's actually an RMIT alumni. She studied interior design, I think, at RMIT, which just goes to show you never know where you end up with what you study. But uh, so Lucy uh, works in that space and is interested in where technology and the body uh, Combine uh, another artist, uh, a little bit more technical, Estelle 
say she was in Australia um, uh, 18 months ago at our symposium event. Estelle worked in clay, uh, so she had an appreciation of 3D space, uh, but she liked the ability to mould and sculpt in 3D space. And she was a drawer and a painter. She used Photoshop, and so she uh, was able to take her Photoshop uh, illustrations and add a z-axis to it that just meant that instead of um, having each layer on top of each other you could move through the layers in adobe aero and that gave her a chance to explore a whole new creative realm starting with what she knew from photoshop so she was able to take um, her long-term skills with photoshop add the adobe aero uh, uh, tool set to that and be able to create brand new experiences to express both her artistic uh, view, but also her design process. Immersive is gonna change the way we create art because it's redefining the relationship between the creator and the audience. For me, you know, interaction goes hand in hand with making art and in this immersive age, we all wanna interact with things in a different way. And so I'm hoping to make people think about those interactions through my artwork. Maybe this exhibit will just create a different perspective in their day-to-day -day life. We can zoom out and see you know, who we are in this planet with a more like long-term perspective. As a body architect, I'm interested in using storytelling to predict and test futures as a way of hovering the imagination and ask important questions. I think AR have the potential to completely make technology and computing far more invisible than it is today. What interaction does is that it takes the experience from a passive one to an actual collaborative experience. The artist is now creates an actual playground to co-create with their viewer. Art merged with technology and science is such a powerful way to imagine where are we going. It's opening up a platform for collaboration between viewers. Technology will be omnipresent, but hopefully if we do it right, it will be invisible. The line's gonna disappear between what we consider traditional fine art and immersive or interactive art. Thank you, Michael. It's really interesting, the, uh, the Festival of the Impossible from Adobe and that blurring of the lines and the opportunity for co-creation. Um, let's turn the conversation now to Noel, and we're going to talk now about collaboration. So how we collaborate on a design project is undergoing a revolution. So Noel, how is cloud-based software contributing to the revolution? Thank you. So Michael's just talked about a Festival of the Impossible and um, the Masters of Communication Design um, went online it's a face-to-face -face studio taught course where we teach master's students uh, communication design um, and it's a very exciting we have one of the best studios i think in uh, at rmit but we left that studio in on about the 19th of march this year for precautionary health means basically um, and uh, we've all worked from home since then so we're one of the first to leave the campus and i guess what we've seen is that having a cloud-based system like Adobe um, has enabled us as communication designers to be distributed right across uh, Melbourne um, and even internationally. And um, people have been able to do um, some really, really remarkable design from their homes. So yeah, I mean, I was really lucky I got to go uh, to uh, the Adobe Roadshow at the beginning of the year, and that was just out of curiosity to see what what's new and what's happening um, in terms of our core tool set um, for uh, communication design. Um, and I was particularly interested in Eero um, in terms of interaction experience design and um, also Rush as well in terms of social media strategies, because we're currently working on a social media strategy, of course, um, in terms of exhibitions that um, uh, current students are curating and designing and have designed. Yeah. Terrific, thanks for that. Let's turn now to Kate. Dr. Kate Sala on our panel. Last year, the world's first piece of digital couture, pictured here now on the screen, uh, was created by The Fabricant and it sold for close to 10,000 US dollars. Uh, Kate, how is digital fashion transforming the industry and will it change the way we consume clothing? Thanks, Dean. Um, that's a really exciting question and I think also a very timely one considering the changes that the fashion industry is currently experiencing um, due to the pandemic. 
I'd say that the fashion industry has been in a constant state of flux in response to the gradual digitization of our daily life. Um, the way we experience fashion has changed. Uh, what used to be, I guess, a fairly mysterious process to the average consumer has now become almost public information. Um, thanks to social media, our understanding of the inner workings of clothing production has been elevated, in fact, and we've now been given the opportunity to demand greater transparency through the sharing of this information. So if you think about um, things like the fashion revolution and the hashtag who made my clothes, that's helped to reshape a collective understanding of garment manufacturing. It's also helped educate us and connect us and experience associated with the clothes we wear. Um, and then the actual digital fashion design takes the digitizing of these fashion experiences to a whole new level. So it transforms a manufacturing process that may be heavily reliant on material outcomes such as sampling, manufacturing, um, and production in some cases of large volumes of clothing to a completely waste-free and, in my opinion, a highly imaginative process. So um, in a time when physical fashion experiences like runways and showrooms are not necessarily viable options, um, which is currently what's happening. Right? Digital fashion design provides a solution which embodies excitement, creativity and innovation in ways that um, I personally could only dream of. Um, and for this very reason, many large companies currently find themselves seeking to have their collections digitized to replace this process. Um, the idea of the runway experience that they can no longer rely upon to sell clothing. Um, and the fabricant who created this incredible dress um, have been approached by many of these companies to fast track that digitization, that, that, that digital process so that they can connect with their consumers um, in a digital way in order to step around that lack of personal interaction that they would have normally relied upon. So you're looking at companies like huge department stores such as Selfridges, um, high-end luxury companies like Marine Serre, Louis Vuitton, Prada, all looking to digital fashion design um, in order to add another dimension of experience into their communication folio, which I think is really exciting. And um, if I could say what a great, what's um, great about this form, um, sorry, what's great about this idea from a learning perspective at RMIT um, is that we believe digital literacy, literacy skills in fashion design seek to enhance our ability to communicate within and also beyond our communities about key issues and innovations within our field. Um, and if I could add in terms of how digital fashion design will affect um, our literal consumption of fashion, well, it may be that we see more virtual, augmented or mixed reality based experiences dominating the retail space instead of that tactile material experience that we've become accustomed to. So it's it's exciting um, and it's a wonderful time to be studying fashion and to be experiencing design in a different way and to be exploring and experimenting with all these new ways and processes of creating and communicating about fashion. It, it certainly is very exciting, Kate. And I, I wonder, does this mean I don't need to go into a change room ever again? That would be a benefit to me, but thank you, well, Kate. For a lot of people, I think it would be, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, moving on. So according to Accenture, uh, smart speakers are one of the fastest adopted technologies in US history. Uh, voice user interfaces, or VUIs for those in the know, uh, introduced a change in the way people interact with machines and are quickly becoming part of our daily lives. Uh, Michael from Adobe, do you think this means there's an emerging opportunity for designers working in the voice space? Dean, absolutely. Um, in fact, Adobe so strongly believes in the future of voice as a technology. We um, we bought a company. We bought SafeSpring. Um, the voice uh, UI that you spoke about uh, with uh, home speaker systems like um, the Amazon Echo um, or um, the, the Apple's um, HomePod, um, they're widely taken up in North America. And so there's definitely a desire for uh, designing for voice, but they also have a screen. Um, they may not be taken up so much in Australia, but I, I want to um, step back and point out that we already engage uh, with a lot of audio and voice UI, um, even using Adobe, uh, using Apple AirPods. Um, I speak to the AirPods and um, I have he other headphones where I engage with them or whether it's in a, 
in my um, in dash uh, navigation guide in my car there are lots of voice and audio interfaces and when i've pointed that out to people in the past they've said well you're just giving instructions and they follow the instructions and i would point out that you know that's where we started uh, that's the initial uh, user experience and becomes much, much more sophisticated. It's uh, like where we started with touch. Uh, 10 years ago, um, the idea of having to design for a touch interface was, was unknown. Uh, it, was, it was extremely limited and very unsophisticated. And with the rise of first the iPhone and then other touch UIs, uh, we've had to have a, and learn a whole new design thinking around touch and not just the graphic design of touch but the uh, process through which you engage with the touch ui and we're going to do the same thing with voice uh, and it's going to be a skill that won't be a specific to a voice ux -er. everybody will need to learn how to design for voice in the same way that traditional designers uh, move from colored oil on squashed up trees uh, designing for paper to also then designing for digital designing for user experience and they'll be adding audio and voice to their design tool set in order for them to in, uh, increase the engagement and increase the experience that they're trying to uh, create through their design. Yeah, I think it's going to be a, an additional design discipline uh, and that is designing for voice. It is certainly an interesting new area. And I have this image of a number of us walking around mumbling to ourselves and people were not realising that we're actually engaging with our devices or or with a, another person in another uh, part of the of the country. Uh, so very exciting times. Do you, you remember when people used to walk, first walked around the street talking hands free? We don't do so much and people thought you were crazy. Once it becomes socially acceptable, uh, which is now it's socially acceptable to use a touch interface in public at dinner, um, we will find the same thing with voice, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, let's move on. So we've heard of fast food, let's talk about fast fashion. Uh, so fast fashion has made shopping for clothes more affordable, uh, but it's come with an environmental price tag. According to the UN, the fashion industry emits more carbon than international flights and the maritime shipping industry combined. Um, and it's the second largest consumer of the world's water supply and it pollutes the oceans with microplastics. Kate, putting you on the spot here, how is technology helping to build a more sustainable fashion future? Yeah, no, that's a, a wonderful question. And I also think that they're really brilliant facts that you state there, Dean, too. So it's really important that we have a great responsibility to, as design practitioners within the fashion space, to hold ourselves accountable and to understand what the impacts are of our choices. Um, I think that technology has undoubtedly been an impact, uh, sorry, an important tool for change in the fashion industry um, and has been working within the field of fashion definitely for a long time to solve many issues that we face in regard to creating uh, a more sustainable industry, if, if I can. So scientists are developing ways to regenerate fibres such as polyester, nylon and cotton over and over again and new innovative biological materials are being turned into fashion fabrics. So there's lots of innovation happening within this space in order to counteract a lot of the waste and um, negative impact that the industry has had. So if you look at biotech advancements, um, we can see living organisms used to make clothing in order to create improved and more sustainable materials. Um, and hopefully in a not too distant future, our clothes could be made and dyed by living microbes in a bid to remove the chemical processes that make the fashion industry so polluting. Um, to name a few exciting examples, you've got genetically engineered um, bacteria being used to replace spider silk, which has been termed as this fabric stronger than steel. Um, companies growing fibres and dyes using algae, which are completely closed loop zero waste solutions that need nothing but sunlight and water to grow. Um, you've also got companies creating fabric out of mycelia, so mushroom roots, um, orange fibres being used, so um, citrus juice byproducts to form soft fabrics. Um, I've even heard and um, read about uh, the building industry taking used nappies and creating roof tiles out of them. So um, there's various different ways in which um, technology is definitely helping the fashion industry in order to create a more sustainable future. And from a sustainable perspective, quite a few of these engineered materials don't need animals um, or petroleum input. So um, yeah, technology is also being used in order to promote 
a more transparent fashion industry, if you look at black blockchain technology and how that can be used in order to, in order to encourage greater transparency in the supply chain process, um, tracking the life cycle of garments evidently seeks to engage us both as makers and consumers to empower us with knowledge so that we can make those informed decisions about what companies we choose to support with our um, purchases. So thinking about how um, financially we are propping up companies we make purchase. Um, and I think also finally from a sustainable fashion business perspective, there's new fashion business models such as renting clothing and also smartphone apps that make it easy to swap and buy and sell secondhand clothes. Um, so much so that Forbes has said that the resale of clothes is expected to be bigger than fast fashion within the next 10 years. So fingers crossed. Very interesting developments in that space. I love this idea of complimenting somebody on the bacteria that they are wearing or on the mushroom fibre shirt they might be wearing. I do too. I really do. <laughs> really move that conversation to a whole other level. Now, you can ask a question uh, during our webinar uh, just by using the Q&A function in the uh, Microsoft uh, Teams site. And we do now have some questions from our uh, audience. Um, and the first one, Kate, back to you. Um, and uh, let's, let's dig a bit deeper into this issue of uh, sustainable uh, uh, fashion. Um, I've heard, the question is, I've heard that dyes used in textiles can be really toxic and wasteful. Um, what is RMIT developing um, around sustainable dyes? Um, so from a learning and teaching perspective, we do look at a variety of these issues within the classroom and we've actually got a dye garden that RMIT has created um, and a composting system. So we're looking at understanding the way that plants can be used in that natural cycle process um, in a small scale way in order to dye clothing to help inform our learning process about the toxicity and the pollution associated with the dyeing of clothing um, and in, in that manufacturing process as well. Um, we also have a variety of different courses on offer that study things like biofashion or um, material alchemy, um, various different ways that we can look at materials and transforming materials so that we're questioning these existing ideas around um, polluting um, the waterways and also the chemicals that run off from the manufacturing process of various different fabrics too. So yeah, RMIT is doing a lot in terms of um, helping through the learning and teaching process, helping students to uncover um, different and more innovative ways to colour and dye um, their fabrics, but also in the, I think, um, academic realm in research, there is quite a lot being done there too. So, yeah, I hope that answers the question. It sure does. Thank you very much, Kate. Next question is for you, Michael, um, from the wonderful world of Adobe. And Adobe has some really exciting developments. You've shared some of those with us. But tell us, how is Adobe working with the students at RMIT? Dean, yes, we're heavily engaged with uh, working with both the faculty and students uh, at RMIT. Uh, I spend a lot of time at uh, Building 9. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I know every coffee shop within a two kilometre radius of Building 9 and I'm looking forward to sooner rather than later getting back there um, and the Brunswick campus and everywhere else at RMIT. Yes, um, how we engage, uh, we engage with both the marketing faculties because uh, RMIT uh, has uh, marketing disciplines uh, using our marketing stack, but I personally am more engaged in the design faculties and engaging with RMIT uh, around uh, both foundational design, um, print design, some people call, uh, working with uh, the school there and how they're using InDesign. But uh, more pertinently, we're heavily involved with the RMIT UX awards. Uh, they're right in the middle of a submission process this week and next week. Hopefully some of the audience are, are part of that, some of your students who are submitting work to the RMIT UX awards that Adobe is very proud to be involved with and to support. Uh, so we engage there. We're uh, going to have the community uh, come along and um, and give feedback on those designs. And then we will have some industry luminaries who will be uh, judging those uh, UX awards. So that's just only one part. Uh, we are involved, as I said, with the uh, uh, design and communication faculty, uh, but with a number of other faculties across RMIT, mostly because uh, everyone wants to present creative expression of their ideas, uh, whether that's through a specific design capability, but even in marketing and other uh, disciplines, you need to be able to express yourself in a creative way. So we're very proud to be involved with RMIT and RMIT students in a number of areas. 
Terrific. Thank you very much for that, Michael. Now let's go back to Building 9, the uh, the ubiquitous Building 9 at the uh, RMIT University campus here in Melbourne. Um, and this is a question for you, uh, Noel. Uh, the type, what uh, the types of projects do communication design students work on uh, at RMIT, whether it's in Building 9 or one of our other many buildings on campus? Uh, well, as I said, might you, the first question for me was about collaboration, and I think we've been having some remarkable collaborations with my, my colleagues that I've worked with for some time, but also all our students as they're distributed across Melbourne. And this is a master's program, and a lot of our projects are actually research informed. Um, and I guess we're looking at what I'd call a T-shaped uh, student. Uh, our core basis is communication design or graphic design. Um, but again, it's broadening out into those areas of interaction and experience design, but based on an individual student's profile. So what do they come in with um, and what do they bring to the table um, at, to us at RMIT with um, communication design? And we hope that they develop through our program um, to basically set their next career trajectory or take a pivot in what they're doing towards something new and different. Um, so for communication design, obviously we run communication design studios. Um, we've, Michael has been great. So we've had him both in the studio and uh, online uh, with Adobe because we tried out um, um, X, Adobe XD and I was at a, a leadership workshop for RMIT and I met a woman called Lauren. Uh, thanks, Lauren, uh, who was researching sustainability um, at RMIT, in general, uh, aligned to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which I've been involved in for quite a long time um, and a great futures exercise. But she was interested about how we might apply them onto campus at RMIT. And I thought that was a great way that we could um, use Adobe XD to get the students engaged in learning about uh, those sustainable development goals. And remember that we only have another 15 years to meet those targets uh, before in 2030, before we have to start all over again and set the new sustainability targets. Wayfinding, that's been mentioned today. We've had a remarkable partnership through engagement with RMIT with Heidi Museum of Modern Art, and we managed to get 20 of our students, along with landscape architecture and public art students out to Heidi to do a field trip. But because of this, uh, the COVID-19 level three um, situation, all our students have had to fall back on desk-based research. So normally, from a human-centered design perspective, we would look at the site, we would observe people experiencing both the beautiful grounds at Heidi and um, engaging with the marvelous art collection they have out there, both inside the buildings, but obviously in the grounds with the sculpture. Um, and that, that's been really remarkable. We did a presentation very recently to them and um, it, the resourcefulness of our students, I think, has been the thing that's really struck me through this. Um, we don't know what they have in their home studios, but I've seen a few of them, and there's a, a remarkable mixture of both digital technology, but also analog technology, and I've seen some beautiful crafted um, wooden materials as well. With uh, COVID-19, I guess it's really reinforced the opportunities to collaborate internationally. Uh, so turning back to you, Kate, um, we have a question here from, from the audience. Um, with the current changes we're all experiencing, do you think international collaboration will become more of a regular occurrence in the design industry? Yes, I definitely do. Thanks, Dean. And also um, a bit of shout out love for the Brunswick campus of RMIT. Um, <laughs> just thought I'd, I'd throw that in there now as well as all of the building nine love. Um, collaboration, yes. So a lot of the studios that we run um, through the Bachelor of Fashion Design as well as Bachelor of Fashion and Textiles, Sustainable Innovation have um, collaboration as the underpinning to the way we structure and scaffold the learning. So we very much believe in bringing in various minds, um, not just nationally, not just from Australia, but also internationally from other schools. Um, and we depend on those relationships that we've built um, with various different practitioners, fashion practitioners, um, designers, artists, um, academics, researchers from around the world in order to share perspectives because I think it's a solid belief that um, we see innovation coming from collaboration and teamwork and the sharing of ideas um, and not through working in institutional silos in isolation. So that is definitely something that we prioritise and we, we seek to embed in all of the learning and teaching that we promote um, within the School of Fashion. And um, and yeah, something that I think will play an important part also speaking a lot about technology and technology's um, impact on fashion and future of fashion. I think also through the discipline, um, we will see a lot of collaboration 
in that technology space as well too for fashion. Terrific. We've all had some experience of isolation over the last few weeks. Um, so I now have a question for all the members of the panel without notice. Um, I'll, I'll start with um, Noel, then we'll go to Michael, then back to you, Kate. Um, and the question is, uh, it, following COVID-19, um, and as we emerge uh, from uh, stage three restrictions, what is your perspective on how the future of design will be influenced or changed for the long term? Let's start with you, Noel. Um, you've kind of got me on my favourite topic actually. Uh, in a way, uh, you know, a favourite definition of design that a friend of mine um, used to use is that we're future grazers, um, that we kind of spend a lot of time in the future, but maybe the near future, not those long, long-term futures. I'm actually quite optimistic and positive about this moment, and I guess there's a couple of things. Uh, it starts with people, but in the long term, um, you know, design has always operated in a collaborative and networked way and with a number of other professionals. And this has been the big challenge for designers. When do they know the limits of design practice and design knowledge? And when do they seek expertise from um, uh, coders, people doing algorithms, um, from other fashion, uh, other sort of design sectors, from industrial design, um, from interior architect, um, architects, fashion designers, and the broader art scene. So we've got this massive creative community. So how are we going to develop these sustainable, livable cities? And I guess from a communication design perspective, it's about people and it's about talking to people. Because, you know, for us, a creative city of literature was about stories. And there has been some remarkable stories in this city. Um, but I think we'd like to share those stories with each other, share them with the world. I mean, I, mean, I see we had a, uh, we've got a Vietnamese audience, so a big shout out to you. Uh, we have a remarkable graduate from our program who's uh, looking to develop her typographic expertise because she's worked on a Vietnamese typeface. Um, and in particular, very difficult diacritics uh, or glyphs that are required for that um, particular language. And we hopefully that she would go to a, a scholarship um, in the United States to develop that. So these are the kind of things that it is. It's both, it's a global problem. We have to look globally, but we also have to fix things locally. And you're right, it's very rich with opportunity uh, in response to um, the COVID-19 uh, uh, issues. So turning now to, to Michael, what, uh, and I'll put the question to you, Michael, um, what, is, uh, what do you see to be the future of design and how might it be influenced uh, as a result of COVID-19? Yes, I think this is a, a pivotal, pivotal moment in history and it will change design and both the design uh, learning of design and design practice. I think it, it will happen in two ways. And, and again, what Adobe thinks it happened in two ways. Um, one is the separation from, of design from production. Um, a lot of terrific design students that I work with spend a, a number of years straight out of design school uh, doing a lot of production. And I think what COVID has done is allow companies to realize that they don't have to be physically together uh, in order to implement the design, that it's okay to uh, have someone else external um, implement your design. And I'm saying we should all know how to produce our designs, but it should allow our creative thinkers to be more creative so that they can utilize the um, internationalization of production. And that's what COVID has done. I think COVID has allowed um, the powers that be to uh, let go of the reins and allow production to happen even more so anywhere around the world. It's also very collaborative, so the reverse of that is um, creativity and design is by its very nature collaborative. Um, I view design as having a purpose. You design for something, whether that's a commercial outcome or even an emotional response, as opposed to art, which is very much in and of itself. So what COVID has done is enabled people to collaborate more frequently and to um, more readily reach that desired outcome, that desired purpose for design. Uh, I, it's become much more collaborative. Um, and I think what hopefully what will carry out of this COVID time will be the willingness and the immediacy of collaborating uh, 
across the desk or across the world as part of the design process. I also see just quickly a lot of um, a lot of our, um, you, uh, our creatives uh, trying out lots of different things. I'm seeing um, uh, print designers trying out user experience design, user experience design trying out video because we've all um, had so much time in our hands that we're learning new things. So I think we'll learn new things, we'll try out new things to add to our, um, our armory of design technologies. I think we'll be more free in our collaboration and I think uh, it's going to actually be a, a good uh, time for design coming up. Absolutely. I think there's some real opportunities there to say about de defining and discovering new ways to have impact. I certainly, one of my reflections is uh, during uh, the last uh, couple of months, I've actually formed a closer bond with my colleagues at the RMIT universities in uh, in Vietnam and Saigon and Hanoi campuses, um, just using the technology and, and connecting virtually. Uh, it's been quite impactful. Um, turning now to Kate for the, uh, the final response to the question. Um, what do you see to be the future of design in response to COVID-19? Over to you, Kate. Thanks, Dean. Um, I think, look, a lot of it has already been covered so eloquently by Noel and Michael, and I think that definitely I have to reinforce those ideas. I believe that collaboration is, is key to the way that we see the future of fashion design to be evolving. Um, more, again, national and international collaboration and an emphasis on understanding what we can um, leverage from one another and from those partnerships and how we can share. So I liked that idea that Noel was kind of touching on the idea of the shared narrative. So we all have these experiences and stories that oftentimes we don't necessarily understand um, how impactful they can be until we share them. And I'm hoping that through this time of learning that we've all had to transition to um, in an online space, we've understood the power of slowing things down, like the learning has had to slow down in order to accommodate not only the pace, the new pace that we've found ourselves within, but also um, to accommodate the external stresses that we find ourselves under. And I think that only um, helps to emphasise how important it is to stay connected. So to be connected with our peers, to be connected with people who are interested in the same ideas within our discipline, but also to cross pollinate like Michael was talking about. So reaching out to people that sit potentially beyond the borders of our field and ask, how can I help to increase what you're learning about, what you're innovating um, with or the discussions that you're having in order to create um, a better world, in all honesty, and in order to have um, less of an, uh, a tangible impact, less of a, um, you know, wasteful impact and more of a positive impact. Um, and I think, honestly, that that does come through collaboration, through sharing of our stories um, and collective inquiry. And um, removing um, a lot of time, removing the ego from that um, interplay and from that, that, um, that exchange. So I'm hoping that that does happen. Um, especially within the field of design, because I know that through uh, prioritising those aspects that we'll see wonderful things happen, and um, especially when acknowledging the sustainable development goals and the responsibility that we all have within that space to adhere to um, minimising our impacts and um, increasing the connections and the beneficial um, connections that we have with each other. Absolutely. I think you make some good points there. I think it's, we're entering in a very exciting time uh, once we move beyond the tragedy that has been COVID-19 yeah. uh, at a global scale of just some of the creativity that's going to emerge and even some of the, the increased mindfulness around issues like sustainability and connection. Um, I, I think we're looking uh, ahead to some very exciting times. Um, so look, with that point, I'd like to thank everybody for their questions today. We have some great questions from the audience. Um, if you couldn't get your, your question answered, don't worry. Um, you still have an opportunity. Please feel free to email your questions through to his email address, campaigns at rmit.edu.au, and we'll try to respond to you as soon as possible. Um, I'd like to say a very big thank you to Noel, Kate and Michael, our experts today, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, Technology Matters, the Future of Design. Thank you.